Fell. Why does the government have the power to prove a bigamy? Um, That's not seems like a fair question to ask. I don't know. Um, they have the ability to uphold the uh, laws that uh, go against them. The moral. Um, Whose morals? Hmm. Mormon worlds? No. Um, Whose morals? I guess what they deem the majority or what common society. The majority's morals. Wouldn't that be imposing some sort of establishment religion to pick one morals as the morality for society? In a way, yes. Anna, what do you think? What? I mean, I'm sure you did this in Con Law 1. What gives the government the right to pick one set of morals over the other when they're structuring the laws of society? I guess it is kind of just unfair, but I think they just mentioned you know, kind of like a common law practice. Oh, oh, who's not so common in Utah? <laughs> yeah. But um, I guess just from like the history of the Constitution and what it was based off of from um, England. But, but I mean, we have this establishment clause, Adi, I'll call on you. Wouldn't it be an establishment religion to say we're going to pick one morality of teaching on marriage and make that the law for everyone? Oh, no, we pick morality. Like, other laws are based on morality. So why isn't that an establishment religion? Because morality doesn't necessarily mean you're establishing a law. Right, but we're picking Christianity. We're not picking LDS, Mormonism. Isn't that picking a religion, the base of our, our government? Oh, it is. It's saying but he, it's just the majority, right? Or it's the majority's religion. That if you're a member of the majority of faith, you can marry according to your dictates of your faith. But if you're a member of this this new this newish religion, you can't. Well, the argument that it's not would be that it's a it's a long held institution. Well, in marriage? That's an important institution, and that's why it needs to be, that's why it can be regulated. Oh, there was polygamy back in the days of the Bible. That's pretty old. That's just the argument for why it's legal. Oh. But then you're picking just a modern variant, not even the traditional variant, aren't you? In fact, there's a much longer tradition of bigamy than there is of same-sex marriage. You can make that point about a Um Cody, so let me ask the same question about the variant. Why can government even enact laws based on religion? What I mean, isn't that goes against establishments? And you know, we haven't covered the topic yet, but isn't that a problem? That's improper to do what? Legislate. <laughs> why is it proper? Because they say so. Who says so? The legislature. Is that the end? Does the First Amendment not trump the limitations on federal power? It does. Yeah, it does. This being proper is not the answer to everything. It's the answer to a lot of things. Not, not in this class. It doesn't work. And by the way, if in case you're curious, there's actually express powers for the territories. It's not clear Congress can act this law in the states, because that would be infringing on state rights. That's almost Windsor and a Burger Club. But this is the territories of which Congress has plenary power. So actually, necessary and proper is not even the right answer here. But it's, it's, it's a good start. So let me ask you a question, right? When government is deciding what laws to have at marriage, they're picking one religion over another, aren't they? So it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. In one sense, they're kind of establishing one religion is the right religion. In the other sense, they're saying your religion's wrong. Am I, am I incorrect? Is that what's going on in Utah? Is that a fair characterization of the law that's going on in Utah? How can that possibly be constitutional? I mean, we're doing the two things you're not supposed to do. We're saying, this is the right religion, number one. And number two, your religion is not just sinful, it's illegal. We'll put you in jail for it. I mean, we have the First Amendment. It's the first one up there. How is this possibly constitutional? How are you on me? I'm calling on you, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I'm looking right at you. you were still giving code no, 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 it's your um, turn. You gave me necessary and proper. Because it's an offense against society? Yeah, but but First Amendment trumps that. I mean, 
because okay. marriage is a civil contract. Is it a civil contract? Why can't you make a bilateral or trilateral contract? <laughs> You're welcome. With, with adequate consideration, of course. <laughs> and a peppercorn or whatever, right? Uh, <laughs> I do promise for a stop. I mean, it's real. It's a contract, right? I could see that. Jacob. <clears throat> because it was outlawed before the amendment was created. No, 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 no. The bigamy law, the territorial law came around after uh, after the first one was ratified. Marriage, for sure, is older than that, but the law at issue. Mark, you're, you're right. This law came around in, well after the 1791. Gotcha. Um, okay, well, if that's not why, they said that the amendment only prohibited the government from abridging uh, ideas or opinions. No, religion. I'm talking about religion, not ideas. He can talk about bigamy as much as he wants, he just can't do it. Well, so. It, it doesn't stop the government from outlawing conduct. Okay, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Shania, you want to bring us home? We're really close now. So, going off of that, kind of just regurgitating what you said. <laughs> regurgitating, um, I like that. As far as beliefs and opinions, there can be no law infringing upon that right but when you transfer into conduct that conforms with your religious beliefs there can be some sort of regulations on what you can do okay i think we're really close that answers half of my question but half of the question correctly okay good so the the first half of the question is how can this be constitutional how can the government dictate a certain set of beliefs that saying your belief is, is sinful this law doesn't actually restrict beliefs, and to be very clear on that point, you can believe in bigamy, in trigamy, I don't know what other word is, right? You can believe in polyamory, whatever the hell you call it now, right? You can believe whatever you want, right? You can believe in whatever you want, but you may not be able to act upon those beliefs. You can believe whatever you want. But you may not be able to act upon those beliefs. So Reynolds, at a very early juncture, sort of recognized this line between belief and conduct. Belief is protected, fully protected. Conduct will not be protected. And just to be clear, what was Mr. Reynolds asking? Conduct. Eric, let me ask you a question a little more precisely. Was Mr. Reynolds trying to strike down or have the entire statute declared unconstitutional, the bigamy statute? Uh, no, I think he was. What was he seeking? What actual relief was he seeking? What was the posture of this case? I would assume to reverse his conviction. Reverse a conviction. Could anyone engage in bigamy under his argument? Uh, I don't think so. Only those who? Uh, for under, uh, only those with the religious. Bingo. So again, he was asking for very specific relief. He was asking for those with, like, like him of his faith and perhaps other faiths, an exception. He wanted the court to carve out an exception from the law. All right. Now, Jamar, let me ask you a question, please. And, and you may not know this, but I'll, I'll try it anyway. Do you think this was a neutral law? Okay, in what sense was it neutral? It was just, I was going to make this comment as a joke when we were talking about contracts, but I guess in property of the idea of tragedy of the commons, where uh. if everyone gets uh, <laughs> a Clever. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> well, try this again. Um, is a law limiting marriage to people of just one and one, right? Two spouses. Is that a neutral law? Think carefully before you answer that. No. Why not? I, just, I guess I still believe it's yes, but it's too much 
Well, <laughs> this is why I said you might not know. So it's a fair point. Back in the 1890s, who were the primary people in the United States who engaged in bigamy? The Mormons. Did Christians engage in bigamy? That's something their religion even permits. By, by the way, so people do bigamy, they just don't make public. Like, you know, they'll, they'll just get married, they can't really get divorced, and they'll just marry someone else. So there is bigamy among Christians, don't get me wrong. But in terms of who's being targeted, I'll ask the question again, Jamar. Why do you think this law is enacted for the um, Utah territories? Anyone LDS here, by chance? Okay. No, no. Aaron, why do you think this law was enacted and, in fact, enforced in the Utah Territory? So, so the Mormons were pretty much persecuted against Oh yeah. From the time they showed up. Oh, yeah, they were. Uh, they were kicked out of all sorts of places. In large part because of which they, practice? They, they basically just continued to move west. In large part while they're being persecuted. Correct. Because, that, you can answer my question, because of what? think it's because essentially a guy just made up a religion. No, 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 no. That's what I'm looking for. Jamar. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. Enough with the more. Yes. Because of the bigamy. This is viewed as such a unconscionable, immoral thing. Yes. Joseph Smith, he started religion. The tablets, it's there. You can, you can learn about it. But the reason why they, or the primary reason why they were so persecuted was they had a different teachings, and among those teachings was bigamy. Okay, try again. Okay, so <laughs> if you talk to an LDS person about bigamy, it's not according to maybe maybe it's a moderate uh, LDS. Uh, the reason they practice bigamy is because everyone was out to get them, and there weren't very many of them, and so that is from from an LDS believer that what they've you, you're telling me all things that might be correct, but my question is more narrow. One of the reasons why this law was so vigorously enforced in the Utah Territory was because of a moral opposition to bigamy. Agreed? Yes, in part, but I think the government's interest is because these people are persecuted, because they're moving out into these places where they have the government has only plenary power and less control of them, they don't want people just making up laws and saying, well, I believe this, this is my religion, so I can just do whatever I believe. Okay, I'm going to get to that. That's, that's, that's a correct point. I'll get to that in a couple minutes, I promise, okay? But let's just sort of just, just, just summarize where we are here, right? Was this a law of neutrality? So in general, in the abstract, a law saying, oh, only two people get married, that seems pretty neutral. But in reality, they were talking about a very particular religion. By the same token, let me bring us back to a burger fell. Texas had a law saying, uh, only men and women get married. Was that a neutral law? Well, in the sense, it wasn't neutral, right? It applied equally. But in reality, this was done for the express purpose of barring gay marriage. So maybe you don't like a burger fault, doesn't matter in this class. But at least in the 1890s, these laws were passed. In fact, Utah, as a condition of statehood, had to put in their constitution, we will never allow plural marriages. That's in their state constitution as a condition of statehood. Scalia mentioned this since I think it's a burger fault dissent. Maybe, maybe it was Romer. One of, the, one of the Scalia dissents that's in there. All right. So again, let's try this one more time. This law... It's perhaps neutral in its face, but in reality, it was done to enact a specific moral view. Now, Adi and Anna, I think, said correctly, most of our laws are based on morality. It's just sort of this modern notion that you can't have morality. And in fact, most morality does come from religion. You can't escape that fact. You know, I like it, but that's just invariably true. Uh, it is true, though, that in biblical times, there were plural marriages. I think Abraham said, you know, Abraham Isaac, one of them had two wives, right? Uh, I'm, I'm bad you tonight, but um, uh, I should look this up before class. But there were plural marriages in the time of the Bible, uh, so that's there. Okay. Now, I want to come now back to Aaron's point. I go to Julianne for this question, if I may. What would it mean, Julianne, if the court would have granted an exception 
to Mr. Reynolds to dismiss the indictment. What would that actually have? What would that have done? I mean, sure, he'd get out of prison, right? But what would that actually legally? What would that that mean to grant exceptions for religion? So, have they granted an exception for him that opens religious beliefs mm. to be uh, exempted from this and then other people who may not actually be religious or follow this so could just go ahead and start marrying people. And what else? We're not just talking about religion here. What would we, that's a matter of doctrine, right? What would it mean to doctrine to allow people to get exceptions from neutral laws based on religious beliefs? It opens the window of asking what other laws can make exceptions. That's what I'm asking you. So tell me. <laughs> I think, well, one of the cases was Yeah. There are other criminal laws that can list that could Just give me one. Sure, why not? Um, well, if you're part of a religion, historically speaking, that our religion is not more like this, uh, that will be a sacrifice. Exactly. Well, thinking that's mentioned uh, the case. You could commit. Okay, so the human sacrifice hypo shows how committed you are to religious liberty, right? That's the, <laughs> that's like the <laughs> that's like do you really do you really mean this? What you're saying? If you really say that a person's religion gives the court the power to create an exception, like oh, what's a big deal? More you know, bigamy, having a second wife. You know, who really cares? Right? Is their own really harm? I mean, maybe the wife is harm, but you know, is, is is this really that bad? Okay, but now human sacrifice. Or, or even make it easier, sacrificing children, right? Because religions have sacrificed children throughout the ages. I'll give you another one, abortion. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, many people of my own faith came out and said, aha, my religion teaches that we should get abortions if the health of the mother's at risk. It's an affirmative commandment. Now, whether that's right or not, I'm not going to get to that right now. But I've actually argued that's kind of like the animal sacrifice example, the human sacrifice example, right? You're, you're not, well, how far do you go with that? So in some sense, when we teach this case, we're like, you know what? This case is right. We draw the line at belief. You can't prove it. But action, you can't prove it. And that's the line that Scalia drew, right? If you look at what Justice Scalia did in the Smith decision, it lines up pretty neatly with the Reynolds case, right? It's more or less the same thing. The problem, though, is the 20th century, right? And you have cases like Sherbert and otherwise that seems to cut in the opposite direction. But at least Reynolds is a very neat decision. Now, when I come back to the first part that I bothered Jonathan, Anna, and Adi about, does it violate the Establishment Clause to pick a certain morality as the default rule? I'll make this question easier. Like during prohibition, during prohibition, alcohol was banned, but most governments allowed sacramental wine. So if you were a Christian or a Catholic, you got to drink. But if you were a member of another faith, you couldn't drink. Now maybe sacramental wine is disgusting, whatever, not important now, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's irrelevant. It's always going to be the case that the majority faith gets its carve outs, right? The majority faith will get its carve out to the legislative process simply because it's the majority. The minority faiths, for example, the LDS, Mormons, uh, think of the Native Americans in the Smith decision, uh, the Seventh day Adventists, uh, members of the Santeria faith, they're not getting their carve outs to the legislative process because they're viewed as weird and different and unusual. Don't say cult like. I heard you. I heard that one, right? But they're viewed as different and not what the I mean, you sort of illustrated the point. They're different, right? They're taking a position that's different than what the majority views as acceptable. And if you sort of accept that premise, two things happen. One, the majority faith gets its carve-outs, can practice as it wishes, but minority faiths will not get their carve-outs. So use, use other examples, right? Let's say, and this happens in Europe, the government says, aha, to preserve a promote animal, a prevent animal cruelty, we're going to bar certain types of slaughter, halal and kosher slaughter, right? The, the, the trend now in Europe is you have to use a stun gun before you slaughter the animal. It's a little, it's like a bolt, and it puts a bolt into your neck to kill them quickly. Um, but that is not the way that kosher and halal slaughter operates. And in fact, most rabbis and imams say that's actually consistent with 
kosher slaughter. So in certain European countries, it's actually illegal to engage in ritual kosher slaughter and halal slaughter. It's illegal. But the European courts, which do not have a first amendment, say, well, you know, we balance the rights of the religious people against the interests of the animal, and the animal wins. Only, only slightly exaggerating, but that's more or less how it breaks down. Because they can import meat from abroad and other things. Another one. Uh, anyone squeamish? Circumcision, right? A lot of people think circumcision is very bad for the child. But there is traditionally back to our friend Abraham mentioned before of circumcision. And there have been some efforts in various countries to ban circumcision. Yeah, the rights of the child versus religious belief, how rights of the child. How do you balance that? Right? There are uh, Santeria, right? Slaughtering of a chicken in, in a very bloody fashion. There are lots of times when these sort of minority religions, which cannot access their, uh, uh, which don't have sufficient votes to pass for legislation, will try to assert religious freedom claims. If you believe in Smith and you believe in Reynolds, the answer to that is too damn bad. All right. Take it up with the legislature. Go seek an exemption. We live in a cosmopolitan society, Scalia says. Take it up with them. Don't, don't bother me. All right, everyone sort of get Reynolds. It's, I, I, I like starting the topic off with this case. It's so simple, but it, it just because it lays all the issues out so cleanly. All right, questions on Reynolds? Anything else? All right, we can move on. All right, let's jump now a bit back in time to the 1780s. This was even before the Constitution was written. And we have Virginia. All right. Now, there was a bill in Virginia. Uh, Ryan? Yeah. What was the bill in Virginia that Madison seemed to be very disturbed by? It was a, it was a tax on... Well, proposed tax. They didn't actually do it. Right. Proposed tax on Christian teachers. Well, who, who was paying the tax? The teachers? No, it was a proposed tax for everybody that would fund, that would go to Christian education. Correct. Yeah. And why was that seen as problematic, at least according to Madison? Because it was basically saying that if you didn't believe, if you weren't a Christian believer, you were still being forced to fund. Now let me just let me just play devil's advocate for a minute. Literally, devil's advocate, I suppose, in this context. Um, I'm going to hell anyway. Um, how are you being forced to believe anything by paying a tax? Right. I mean, we pay tax. We asked this question last week, right? We pay taxes for lots of things we don't agree with. Why does making? I mean, you don't have to go to church. You don't have to actually attend this instruction. You're paying a tax for it. Why does making someone pay a tax burden their religion? Actually, not an easy question. It's, I mean, because you're supporting, by supporting, by paying that tax, you might be inadvertently or you might be harming your own faith by. How? Because you're, you might believe that propping up Christian religion actually hurts society as a whole because their religion is wrong and by funding it. But we fund lots of crap, right? We fund lots of stuff in government. So, 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 Lane, let me ask you the same question. How is it that funding religions any different than funding, you know, the Department of whatever, things that you think are destroyed? Funding a war that you don't agree with, right? Fund, funding a tyrannical king that you think is destroying society, right? Well, why is this any, any problem? Why is this different from anything else? Um, I would guess it's kind of along the lines of the person's religion is like very core to who they are, whereas people who are pacifists believe hardcore that war is evil, right? If, you, if, you, if you're if you're a radical, you think that the, the king, the, the monarchy, is evil. Is religion different? In other words, is, oh, is religion different than a, a pure political belief? 
some people, their political beliefs are fanatical. It's almost strong. Atheists have very strong political beliefs. Is a political belief different? Uh, I would argue yes, but... Tell me why. That's a fair position. Tell me why. There's a difference between arguing tax rates and arguing the existence of the world. And like tell me why. Okay, tell me why. Uh, I'm pushing you, but fundamentals I'm... matters. Tax rates. What's fundamentals? Tell me what that means. I don't know what that means. So, like, what you believe about the world? Why? Matters. Why does it matter more? I mean, day to day fundamentals. I don't know, but I pay taxes. That 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 affects me a lot. You're so close. I don't know. I was. I just think of like it's more of like the core of somebody. Else. Okay, Jonathan, I take a step. Uh, I guess going along, trying to go along that line. Um, religion is so much more fundamental to how someone individually is as a human being. Okay. It goes to rather we have to pay taxes, sure, and we pay things and we pay for things that we don't like, but if we have to pay for something that goes against or is in spite of who we fundamentally are as a human being. This word fundamental, you keep saying fundamental. I don't know what that means. It's a word you keep using. I'm not sure what it um, means. Gosh, you got synonyms. I know. <laughs> uh, I would just say that it's is I, I wasn't going to do this line of questions when Leighton walked into it. He opened that door as I say, Anna, why is religion different? Why is religion special? Uh, well, I did like this quote on the signature, but it said, like, religion is a matter that loves to be known as God. Ooh, we're getting close now. Okay, what does that mean? And then they were kind of just saying, like, uh, the legislative powers of the government reach actions only known from there. Go back to the first sentence, right? What does it mean that religion between a man and his God? Why is that different? Uh, oh, well, I guess that is just something. Don't say fundamental. No, it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's, I guess. What would have happened to Mr. Reynolds if he did not engage in polygamy? Well, in his eyes, he. Like it would, have, it just would have not been good. In the oh, it's of God or... it, it, it's worse than not good. It's 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 bad. <laughs> You're offending your God. And what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eternal damnation. You think the IRS is bad? Wait till you go to the circles of hell, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Oh my God, the IRS in hell is really bad. <laughs> it's it's tax day every day. It's always April fifteenth. Um, all right, we're getting closer. Adi, why is religion different? Why is religion different than just political preferences? Um, well, because it's the most important thing. Like, you, the government can't, they can't legislate your political preferences, but they can't, well, I mean, that's what I really think. Like, they shouldn't be able to dictate what you believe because that's what... But why, why is opposition to war because of you're a pacifist any different than opposition to war because you're a Quaker? Why is that different? The same belief, I oppose war, one because I don't believe in war, the other because my religion teaches it to me. Why is the religion angle making it so much different? Well, because one is more one is more important because it has to do with like the, the most central part of your conscience and like things that you or some of your brothers. If you're an atheist who's a pacifist, that's pretty damn central. Why is religion different? to do things that are beyond this world. Okay. And it doesn't and it, it would require you to not listen to a government sometimes and it would be that you follow a higher order instead of a government. I think we're close now. Okay. Everyone sort of just got what Anna and Adi said. I think I think we're we're we're, we're pretty close. At least as Madison gets it, right? Whether you agree with this or not, doesn't matter, right? It matters, but that's not what I'm getting at here, right? At least as Madison understood it, religion was different than any just general opposition to taxes because it was of a higher power, of a different world, right? We have the here and now, which is whatever our government does to us, fine, whatever. But 
there's what comes after that world. And whatever your faith, whatever your teachings are, different answer what that comes later. But Madison said, we can control what happens here, but we shouldn't try to force people to do something bad will happen later. Right? So let's say that someone, in fact, believes that supporting the Christian church, this was Lightning's question a few minutes ago, it, it goes contrary to their religion, right? Let's say that, you know, I'm Jewish, right? Let's say I'm funny Christian ministry. They're teaching people that's opposite to me. Why am I doing that, right? In Madison's view, that's something that goes to a higher order, a higher power, and that the government should not intervene, right? He writes, and this is actually not Madison. This is actually the George Mason, the Declaration of Rights. Mason wrote, religion or the duty we owe our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. The religion of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man and is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. In other words, nothing in government can get between you and God. Whatever that belief is, it's an unalienable right. Unalienable. Cannot be abridged. Because of our duty towards the Creator. This is the sort of the base of why religion is different. Right? It's why, again, if you're a pacifist because you oppose war and you're an atheist, and then you're a pacifist because you're a Quaker, why do we give the Quaker so much more protection? Now, in modern law, we treat them more or less the same. Conscious beliefs and religious beliefs are considered more or less distinguishable. Uh, but I don't think that's how Madison would have understood it back in the 1780s. And Madison recognizes expressly the rights of the majority and the rights of the minority. Right? It's always going to happen that the majority will enact policies based on the majority of religion. They're saying we need to be very careful not to impose upon faith. And he also says, look, if, we're, if, if we in Virginia are forcing people to pay a tax for this Christian church, what are other states going to do? My goodness, there were Catholic states back then, right? You know, they're the Papists, right? What kind of laws are they going to enact? I'm being slightly sarcastic, but it's true. There were different states. What's that? There would be offering plates everywhere. I, there offering plates everywhere, right? Okay. <laughs> So this, this document that Madison wrote, it's called the Memorial and Remonstrance, is one of the most important documents in American religious history. We'll do the Danbury Baptist letter from Jefferson, I think, next week. But this is just a very important statement of why religion is different. Again, let's say that you don't want to work on Saturdays because you're lazy. Nothing with your Sabbath. You, you, you like sleeping, you like watching cartoons, right? Can you get an exemption from the unemployment law? No. Let's say you like eating py ingesting peyote because you like getting high. Right, I'm, I'm I'm not being diminishing thing. Religion, you, just like, you you enjoy the hallucinogenic effects of the of the of the peyote. You get any exception? No. It's only because you're doing this in pursuit of some sort of higher power. Right, the government can't come between you and your God, because whatever happens here, okay, we can put you in jail, we can lock you up, but eventually we all die. Right, none of us are are immortal. I don't think we are, but none of us are immortal. What happens afterwards? Right, everyone got that? But Lane, I wasn't going down this road, but you walked right into it. Does that does that kind of elucidate what you were getting at before? Yeah, that's exactly what I was. Like what? No, no, I'm serious. Fundamental. That's where you sort of getting at, like yeah. above you, a higher power, right? Okay, good. Good. I wasn't going to do this, but but you know, I'm most happy to deviate when students uh, want me to. All right. Any questions on that on the memorial? And this was, by the way, it was written anonymously. Everyone knew it was Madison, but so it wasn't signed by him. Uh, this sort of put Madison on the map, and a couple years later, he went to the, uh, the Philadelphia Convention as one of the youngest. I don't think he was even 30 then. He was such a young guy. The, the picture of your book, it was by Charles Wilson Peale of Madison. I don't think he was even 30 years old. What year was he born? Uh, Madison was born in uh, 1751, so he was like 33 or 34. I mean, he was a young man at this point. It's amazing. At the convention, he was 36 years old. You want to feel unproductive with your life? James Madison helped write the Constitution at 36 years old. Joseph's story was appointed to the Supreme Court 35. Or no, 32. 32, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not the equivalent of 75 now. <laughs> was 35, 75? I don't know. I'm not sure. 
uh, by the way, he was tiny. The guy was only five foot four. He was really small, Madison. Very sickly, too. He was always very ill. Uh, but uh, very good writer. Okay. Anything else on Madison? All right. Let's go from Madison to Brennan. Um, we jump now from the 1780s. We did the 1890s to 1960s. And we get Sherbert against Werner. And this is a case that people sort of like until they start thinking about it very much, and it gets a little bit tricky. Um, again, it was a Justice Brennan decision from the 1960s, and one of the sort of the broader approach to the 60s is let's scrutinize everything, right? Let's fit everything into some sort of tier of scrutiny. That was just how they did Kamala back in the 60s. And you can see what Brennan's trying to do here. He's trying to basically bring a strict scrutiny standard um, to the religious context. Okay, uh, Cody, I think you're next. Yeah, can you give me the facts, please, Sherbert. Uh, yeah, so Sherbert was a member of the Seven Day Seventh Day Adventist Church, mm-hmm. um, and their Sabbath day was on Saturday. And her employer required her to work on Saturday, and she refused to. Um, so they let her go, and so she filed for unemployment with South Carolina was an employment <clears throat> um, agency, mm-hmm. and they said that she was disqualified because she. Willing, like she didn't have a reason to not be working, or a valid reason to not be working on, on Saturday, Saturday, right? On Saturday, right? Okay, all right, good. Thank you so much. So this is a um, a fairly common issue. Um, if you live in South Carolina and you were, let's just say, Catholic or Baptist or Protestant or whatever else, Cody, would this law pose any problems for you? Why not? Yeah, Sabbath on Sunday. They don't expect you to work on Sunday. Again, like with the Mormon law, this is a law passed based on the majority sense of morality. Once you see this, you realize how common it is. If I never thought about it, there are so many laws that are embedded in society that are based on morality. There's so many, you can't even count them, which is why when you read Windsor and Justice Kane's like, shocked, shocked, that would be a law based on morality. It's like, all right, yeah, get on with it, right? Every law is based on some sense of morality, and it's based on some sense that, that this is the right way of doing things. You still have laws to this day that limit the sale of alcohol on Sunday, right? You know about these laws. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're a good person, right? But, um, <laughs> hey, <laughs> see, majority rule, man. Uh, we have lots and lots of laws that are premised on morality. Again, the, the holding in Windsor that moral disapproval is not a rational basis for law uh, still, I can get over a burger fly. I can't get over that part of Windsor. It's just that it was such as a, a, an empty statement that just ignores so much law. But anyway, I digress. Um, uh, where was I? Right. So the the law here was based on the majority exception of morality. Now, it could be that if you were a member of the South Carolina Department of whatever, Employment Bureau, whatever, and Miss Sherber came to you and said, hey, look, you know, I have this religious objection. Can't you just accommodate me? They could say yes, right? Nothing would stop the state from saying yes. I don't think it would violate the establishment clause to give her an exception. But they said no, right? Dylan, why did the government not give her the exemption? This isn't entirely obvious from the case. See if we can sort of piece it together. Why did the court, why did the government, forget the court, why did the government not just let this woman, uh, you know, Get her employment benefits because she does my work on Saturday. What were they worried about? Um, well, I'm not sure I remember reading anything other than like the common sense problem of then everybody would try to stay away from working on Saturdays. You're very close. And what's the what's the concern? What's the risk? If you start handing out lots of exemptions, what do you call that? You open the door. Open the door to what? What do you call them? People request benefits they really shouldn't be entitled to. Fraud. Fraud. Perfect. Fraud. That's what you're saying, Ryan. Fraud. I'm over here. Sidebar. Right. Fraud. Is that what you said? Yeah. Good. Just making sure. Okay. <laughs> Fraud. So look, let's just be sort of just bureaucrats for a minute. When you have a bright line rule, there's a benefit. It's easy to apply. The rule says. As long as you're willing to work six days a week, 
you can get these benefits. But if you're unwilling to work any of these six days of the week, you're disqualified. That's an easy rule, right? Any, any government official can apply that rule fairly. But once you start putting in carve-outs, someone says, oh, yeah, my religion requires me to uh, worship on s Saturday. I can't work that day. How do you prove that? You get a letter from a priest? You actually see if they are, in fact, worshiping on Saturday, or they're just chilling out watching cartoons? Is all Saturday morning cartoons? Is that still a thing? I don't know. Whatever. It's still streaming now, anyway. All right? So you can imagine the government says, look, we are not hateful people. We don't hate Seventh-day Adventists, right? We're not we're like anti-Mormon bashing. We just want to have a clean rule that's easy to apply. And allowing people to get carve-outs creates a risk of fraud and difficulty to administer this policy. That's the state's interest, right? The state's interest is, is, is reducing fraud. And then Justice Brennan says, hold my beer, right? Because that's not enough. Right? So Jacob, first off, let me, let's just go to a more basic thing. Is anybody forcing Ms. Sherbert to work on her Sabbath? No. I mean, mm. I get, I get in the fundamental world, they call it like a constructive discharge. No, no one's discharging her. This is about a benefit. Right. If she doesn't want to work on Saturday, what happens to her? She's fine. Well, she got fired, sure. I'm talking about the government here. Is the government forcing her to work on Saturday? Yeah, go work somewhere else. So what? 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 What's the burden? We ask about you know burdening religion. What the hell is the burden here? The burden is that you uh, allow, I guess, this unemployment administration to get away with just not proving. But what's the burden on her religion? Is anyone telling you you can't hold this belief? No. Is anyone stopping her from going to church on Sunday? I'm sorry, Saturday. So what's the burden? Burden is that she can't work for employers that don't respect her. Uh, that's fine, but that's a private issue, right? My question is, how is the government burdening her religion? Can I? What is the burden? Burden? What is the burden? talked about you know, exerting some kind of pressure on her because essentially she's being forced to choose you know employers want somebody who's going to be able to come to work but if you can't find an employer who's willing to this is not about the employer how is the government's not making her get a job how is the government burdening her wait hold on what are we talk what what is being denied to Ms. Sherbert? Oh, she's disqualified from being eligible for these unemployment benefits. Is denying someone a benefit burdening their religion? You're smiling. I am nervous tick. That's okay. Um, it looks good to me. It's, is disqualifying someone from benefits burdening their religion? They're, they're not telling her what her beliefs have to be. They're not putting her in jail if she goes to church. They're saying we're just not going to use the money. How is that burdening her religion? I mean, you're kind of putting her in like in between a rock and a hard place because if she can't get the benefits and she can't find a job, something's <laughs> So maybe she might have to give on her. Right, but but I mean, let's just, I'll go to Eric for a minute, right? With Reynolds, with the Reynolds case, they said, if you marry multiple women, we're going to put you in jail. And he says, if I don't marry these women, I'm going to go to hell. Right? He didn't have a choice. He either follows religion or he goes to jail. What happens if Miss Sherbert follows religion? Does anything happen to her? Is she, is she going to jail? She doesn't get her back. So how is denying her the benefits burning her religion? That's my question, too. Shania says a rock in the hard place. W what does that mean? Why? Why, why is there a rock? Why is there a hard place? Just don't take the benefits, and you can believe and practice however you wish. I would say, in this case, it's probably maybe comparative. Um, especially if she wasn't practicing her religion, comparatively, she would be able to. 
Ah, so putting a condition on the exercise of her beliefs is a burden. Shamara, where's the burden here? But how's that burdening her? Let me ask you a question, right? Let's say the government said, we will impose a fine or a tax on whoever goes to worships on Saturday. Could they do that? No. Is that different from what the government's doing here? Yeah. Okay. Why are they different? How is the government choosing what her Sabbath day is? How is the government choosing what her She can worship any day she wants. All right. I've beaten this one to death. Anyone else want to add, Julian? It may not be a very clear direct burden, but here it's not just that she got fired for not working on Saturday. She also was not able to obtain any other employment. She could work somewhere else. I just she couldn't find a job. It was just very difficult. But then it leaves her with the situation, kind of going back to the rock and the hard place of she needs a job in order to pay for taxes, be able to live, do all these things, be a productive member of society, or she needs to have an employment. Does her religion require to take handouts? I'm not being I'm not being pejorative, but I mean, why can't you just find a part time job that doesn't have a gig on uh, thing on Wednesday? It's, that, that's not the government's fault. That's the market's fault. Well, with that perspective, yes, it's not necessarily the government who's saying who she can or cannot work for, but. They're denying her the ability to get the unemployment benefits in the interim until she does find an employer. Uh, all right, all right. Adi and Ryan. Well, it kind of is like the unconstitutional conditions doctrine where it plays. What is that? No, people don't know what that is. The unconstitutional conditions doctrine is that the government can't put a if it has if there's like a condition for employment, it can't burden a religion in a way that it doesn't other. Uh, Okay, good, good. All right, so unconstitutional, unconstitutional conditions is just sort of this weird doctrine. I don't even teach it. It works like this. Imagine you live in public housing. You say, okay, you live in public housing. Guess what? You waive your Fourth Amendment right. We can search you whenever we want. The court said that's a no-no, right? That you can't be forced to surrender your constitutional right as a condition of some governmental benefit. So that might be what's going on here. Right? Ryan, do you want to add anything else? No, I'm just going to, I was just, I mean, I think you kind of said it better. I was going to say that Brennan was saying that by not being her that benefit, you're in, a, in essence fucking her. Okay, it's indirect. That, that's more or less what he says. That the government imposing, this government imposition is putting a choice to her. You either follow your religion, or you face a penalty, right? You follow your religion or you face a penalty. Now, to be very clear, that's not an actual choice, right? She can just decline the benefits and nothing happens to her. She's just a little bit poor. But this was very much how the court approached things in the 60s, the idea that withholding a governmental benefit was itself a violation of a constitutional right. There was this idea that you actually have to entitled into this and you can't be denied it. Did you do the procedural due process cases like Rothy Board of Regents? And I don't teach those, but but it's in the same gestalt, right? The idea that denying the benefit is itself a violation of your rights. But this isn't obvious to me. No matter how many times I teach, I still have trouble with this, right? This is why I say this case seems great at first blush, but falls apart very quickly. It's not clear to me that um, there's a burden, but the court says there is. Now we turn to the state's interest. I think we already did this with Jacob and Shania a couple minutes ago, right? What's the state's interest here? It's policing against fraud. Is that a compelling interest? The court says, no, it's not compelling. Might be important, but it's not compelling. And then we sort of get to the question of scrutiny. Let's say, okay, that, that policing against fraud is important. Uh, I think Aaron, no, Jamar, who's next? Aaron. Aaron, let's say that policing against fraud is important. Is there some other way the government could achieve that interest without burdening Ms. Uh, Sherbert's religion? If they're, re- if they're really worried about fraud, how could they do that without denying claims of Sabbatarians? How can the uh, government do anything? How, yeah. They could, I mean, it's, in some sense, the law isn't across the board. Like you said, like the black 
a bright line rule to apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, they could do it by less restrictive means. I'm asking, what would such a less restrictive means be? I mean, you could have an objective standard and and apply it. I guess by the facts of each individual case. What would it take to do that? Just I'm asking for an actual solution. What could be done to accomplish that with the least restrictive means? Like uh, interviewing. Yeah. Yeah. Having more staff, right? Hire more inspectors to uh, determine if the claim is is valid, right? Include on an application: Is this a valid religious belief? Make someone sign off on it, right? There are lots of other less restrictive ways to do this. And the court uses this phrase, the least restrictive means. Not less restrictive, least restrictive means. What Brennan is saying here is that you must choose the one approach that has the fewest burdens on religion. Right? Not just you could choose something else. What is the least restrictive means? This is not it. Now, Julianne, let me ask you this question for a moment. Let's say they, they go ahead and hire more officials, right? They hire more inspectors. And let's say that they, um, you know, start asking people um, these questions. And one of the questions they ask is, is your belief sincerely held? That's the question in the form. <coughs> is your belief sincerely held? That's the question in the form. And then the government official comes up with this interview and says, okay, prove to me your belief is sincere. <laughs> I feel like that is not something you specifically do or answer because realistically in the <laughs> philosophy of faith, um, people's religions vary on what is sincere versus what is not. How on so earth do you prove do you prove a belief is sincere, my friend? <laughs> there are ways that you could, but then you have to question the standard of what is considered sincere. Can courts determine if a belief is sincere? Oh, they do. All the time. So here's the rule. Courts cannot decide what the doctrines of faith are. Right? Court can't say, oh, well, you know what? Your religion really doesn't prohibit eating pork. That's just a myth, right? The court has to take a person's tenets of faith as a given. Whatever the doctrines are, you take it as a given. But they can determine if you're sincere. If you're seeking opposition to the draft because of religious beliefs, is that because you just don't want to die, or you have a sincere religious belief. If you are seeking an opposition to a vaccine, I remember that, yeah, the COVID stuff, right? Is this belief sincere? Or you just don't want to get the shot. You, you, you're, not, you're not happy with this answer, Julianne. I don't like it because I feel like I know you don't. It's... Not to believe the sincerity of your belief. Be very clear. Personal example: I was raised in church, and I was a Catholic for a lot of went through that phase of questioning my faith, but I didn't necessarily throw it away. So if you have somebody in that little interim who's like, I'm not fully not a Catholic, but I'm not fully a Catholic, mm. then they're automatically. I remember it's funny, I was sitting in First Amendment Law School, I think at the exact same point many years ago, at the exact same point when I was a student. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Anyone else want to put, uh, chime in on this issue? I remember at the exact same point that Julian just raised, funny, I had deja vu. Uh, 2007 or so, 2008, I can't remember what year it was. Yeah. How do they determine what is sincere? All right. This became a really big deal during COVID, right? One way you can probe sincerity, and you're not going to like this, Julianne, I promise you, is are there other aspects of your faith in which you take a consistent position? In other words, if the only time you're exhibiting some sort of outward faith is the one thing you're seeking exemption for, it may not be sincere. So, for example, let's say that you, you claim a religious opposition to abortion, a, a, a religious need to have an abortion. This came up. And in every other fast of your life, you have no outward religious beliefs. But this one you do. You're really not going to like this one. What about this one? People claim they oppose the COVID vaccine because the, um, uh, 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 the fetal cells were used in development. Okay. Well, do they use object to Tylenol, which was maybe developed in similar processes? This was used to snag a lot of people. The easier way is getting a letter from a priest or a minister or someone else, right? That's the easy way of doing it. But if the government wants to be really sticklers, they can actually probe. When did you adopt these beliefs? 
What, what outward manifestations of these beliefs do you have? Are you consistent in applying these beliefs? Or are you just applying it here to get a carve out? Oh, you are not happy with my answer here. I can just see you're getting angry at me right now. Oh, my goodness. I know. I know. Doctrine. But this is this is perhaps the and this is why, let me tell you this point bluntly, the government almost never challenges sincerity. In all the cases you're going to read in our book and otherwise, they almost presume the defendants are sincere. Why? Because it's so awkward to do the opposite. Um, uh, so another case which you may be familiar with is a Hobby Lobby decision, right? This was a, a craft store. I get all myself framed there. I love that place. Uh, but they, the owners of the store, it's a very religious family. It's, it's a trust that owns it. They opposed certain forms of contraception. And they opposed providing those contraceptions to their employees, and they, they challenged aspects of the Affordable Care Act. It turned out that they were actually providing some of those contraceptives earlier, and they didn't realize it. And some people said, aha, they're, they're being insincere. The government did not challenge it. They said, look, we believe these are, they're sincere. When they found out they changed their policy, they didn't believe it. So oh, they're, they're a bunch of hypocrites, right? Everyone calls each other hypocrites. Like, oh, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. But people are complex, right? It's hard to sort of pin people down. Uh, my favorite is the Little Sisters of the Poor, right? This is a group of nuns who ran retirement homes in Colorado and elsewhere. And they opposed to a contraceptive mandate. And they had, why, are con why did nuns need contraception, right? It was asked. Me. Well, because they have non-nun employees, right? Not everyone's celibate in the, in the building. So there are some, some, some non-celibate people. But is anyone going to question a bus full of nuns as being sincere? So in all these cases, you know, like that, in all these cases, you presume sincerity. But I can tell you, Julian, lurking in the background of some of the cynics, like, oh, this is BS, right? These are not, these are not sincere people. When I've gotten into my most trouble, oh God, I shouldn't do this, is when I've challenged people's sincerity. In the abortion religious context, a lot of people are not sincere. They just really like Roe v. Wade. They're not actually engaging in religious belief. This is not sincere. So the, the, there's the Church of the Saintness, for example, right? Um, I've argued that they're probably not very sincere, that, they, that, that the religion is somewhat cynical, and it's basically a mockery of religion. And, and this is just a way of just shining a light on, on uh, why religion's bad. Now, they don't like when I say this, I get in trouble, but I, I would actually have more jurisprudence on sincerity uh, if we're going to take, uh, take this seriously. But uh, look, and, and I, the other way, even during COVID, a lot of Jewish people came to say, Josh, I want to get an exception for vaccine mandate. And the truth is, Judaism does not have opposition to using fetal cells in a, in, in a vaccine. Like, there are a couple of rabbis that said this, but it's a very minority position. And I came out and I said, this is not really Judaism what you're doing, right? This is, you're doing something else. I don't like to say it, but I don't think you're being sincere. You may not like vaccines because you think it's untested and you don't know what's going to happen to you and a million things, but you can't really claim this is religious. People did. And, and trust me, I, I work for a religious Jewish nonprofit and we turn a lot of people away. So it's not just the abortion. I, I think sincerity should matter more because we shouldn't let people use religion as a carve out to the law unless it's actually sincere. But Julian, to your point, sincerity is baked in. You can't get rid of this one. This is in the law. We'll study the RIFRA in a minute, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It says in the statute, sincerely held belief. It's right there, sincerity. So you don't like that one, but that, that's what you got. But you cannot challenge it. Oh, no, no. Your religion doesn't really hold that belief. You can't do that. You can't have a court sit in judgment of what a religion is. You can't have a court sit in judgment of what's sincere. Yeah, when I when I when I start questioning sincerity, people get really mad at me. That's, I've gotten more hate more than anything else I've done. But it's there. Cody, save us. Yeah, yeah. What if they truly are sincere, but the religion itself doesn't support? Like they're, like they're well, the the rub is you can find a a, a rabbi or a priest or a minister say just about anything. Right. And that's why it's very hard to pin down what the religion actually says. Right. You can just say, you know what? I had a revelation. I had a revelation, the revelation of Josh. Right. And all the teaching of my faith at this point have been wrong. And I found a new revelation. And my revelation says you cannot use fetal cells in development vaccines. Or I had a revelation that the sacrament is not the, the blood in, of Christ. It's actually marijuana. And I'm the church of marijuana. This is real. There's a church of marijuana. All these people who get convicted on drug convictions say, oh, no, this is my religious belief to use marijuana as my sacrament. 
don't laugh. It, these are actual cases. In fact, I've researched this, and they're challenging that this is not sincere. This is bogus. You're making this up because you got busted for having lots of pot. And in fact, there was one case I read. I think it was from Colorado or somewhere up in those box states, and um, uh, and they actually they had like these bales of marijuana, and before they picked them up, they basically just uh, uh, gave the guy a title. So you are now a, a, a minister in our church. Congratulations. Go pick up the drugs. Right? They actually had a they actually had like a ritual of some sort. I can't remember the specifics before they engaged in the drug transaction. But you see how dangerous this doctrine is, right? If you actually take this seriously, and you don't probe for sincerity, every every man becomes a law unto himself. Right? That's what Reynolds says. We'll get to Scalia in a minute. I mean, look, Scalia was not hostile to religious liberty. Don't get me wrong. He was hostile to what Brennan was doing, which would be allowing every person to be a law unto himself. Smith is not popular on the right today. It's not. Their entire movement's over Rule Smith. And then we'll get to the Fulton case next week. But, but Scalia's like, let's be careful. All right. So let me just summarize um, Brennan here. Because again, Brennan, he's never always perfectly clear what he's saying. He kind of just puts stuff out there and says, oh, I'll fix up later. That's how he would do his work. Uh, but we have the Sherbert test, right? We have the Sherbert test. What is the Sherbert test? There's really two components. First, has the government imposed a substantial burden on religion? Has the government imposed a substantial burden on religion? Okay. If they have, you have to follow the test. Is the law the least restrictive means, again, the least restrictive means to achieve a compelling state interest? the least restrictive means to achieve a compelling state interest. This might look like strict scrutiny, but it's even stricter than strict scrutiny. Why? Yeah, I'll, I'll put this in the board so that, that you have it for your notes. Uh, here it is. Right? This is actually stricter than strict scrutiny. Why? It's not just required to be narrowly tailored. You must be the least restrictive means. What does it mean to be the least restrictive? In all the universe, there's only one way of accomplishing this. You must choose that one way. If you choose anything else but that least restrictive means, you're unconstitutional. This is a very hard standard to satisfy. And unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, it became unpopular on the right. On the left, this was awesome, right? Because it gave all these minority religions the power to clap back at, at a Christian majoritarianism, right? But on the right, like, wait a minute, what, what are we doing here? We're letting all these religious minorities be laws unto themselves. Right? One such case, you read the supplement, I didn't sign in the book, is Wisconsin against Yoder. You saw this one in the supplement, right? This involved a, a, an Amish child. Uh, the Amish people, they don't send their kids to school past the eighth grade, which is, what, about 13, 14 years old? Or I guess 12 or 13 years old. Uh, the state of Wisconsin required mandatory education until the age of a 16. And they actually saw an exemption and they won. Right? Why? If the state is so interested in having religious, I'm sorry, education for the Amish kids, create a vocational school, do something else, right? The least restrictive means test requires you to choose the very least restrictive means. If some other state has a vocational school for the Amish, do the same thing. And because you didn't do it, your policy is unconstitutional. This test puts the state to a very small latitude of stuff they can do. And if they don't do the least restrictive means, the least burdensome thing, they lose. And that's Yoder. Okay. Questions on Yoder? I'm sorry, on, on uh, Sherbert. So one, just one caveat. Scalia says in um, uh, Smith that Sherbert was the only time the test was actually applied and to strike down law. Not exactly correct. <clears throat> Scalia discusses this concept of a hybrid right. I'll just mention here briefly. Anyone pick up what a hybrid right is? Right. Correct. Exactly right. So Yoder is sort of unique in that it's religion, but it's also parental rights. Under Pierce v. Society of Sisters and Meyer against Nebraska, they have power to, I'm sorry, the government, the parents have the power to direct how their kids are raised. 
They can go to this school, they can learn this language and so on. So what Scalia said in Smith is that Yoder is unique in that it reinforces religion and parental rights, and they often do go hand in hand. Uh, so this is how Scalia said, oh, Yoder's different, right? So he says the only time a court declared a law unconstitutional under Sherbert was Sherbert itself. If you read the dissent by Justice O'Connor, he's like, that's garbage, right? That, that, that's not accurate. And I think Scalia kind of, he kind of made up the hybrid rights thing. It didn't really ever come back. No one ever really talks about it, but there. All right. Let's do the facts in Smith. Who, who after? I don't remember. Right. You know? All right. Go ahead. Uh, give us the facts in Smith, please. So in Smith, there was a guy who was a, working for a, um, a drug rehabilitation organization. Mm -hmm. He was fired for, um, am I on the right yeah. No, you're in the right case. Okay. He was fired for uh, misconduct, basically for using uh, peyote. What, what is what is peyote? It's a you know, hallucinogen. Uh, it's a hallucinogenic plant. That, okay. It will never. I shouldn't ask that question. Actually, no. I <laughs> I had a student who was a Native American, maybe seven or eight years ago. I actually, had done this ritual. Um, so I'll just relay what he told me. I've never used this. I've not done any controlled substances. I'm boring. Uh, but he said it's actually very bitter and unpleasant. In other words, people would not do this for fun, right? You're basically vomiting a lot. It, it's not like a – how do I put this the wrong way? It's not a fun drug. I guess there are other fun drugs. I don't even know. I don't, you're asking the wrong person, right? But this is not something that's pleasant. In other words, this is not like a re – oh, recreational. That's what I want to use. This is not a recreational drug. This is a very serious drug. It's not refined. There's a lot of puking. It's very bitter. You have, like, these buckets of water everywhere. No, don't laugh. It, it, it's a ritual, and I think it shows a commitment to the faith that you are voluntarily undertaking uh, uh, the, 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 the sacrament to try to achieve some sort of higher state of being and awareness. So I, it, I, I, I don't have any any ill will against people who use it, but this is not like a guy trying to get high, right? This is not just people just you know smoking dope on the side. All right, all right, Ryan. So uh, Mr. Smith, he lost his job, and what did he do? Uh, he filed for <clears throat> unemployment compensation, and just like in Sherbert. Just, yeah, just like in Sherbert. Is it just like in Sherbert? Well, it's not just like Sherbert. Ooh. But, it, but in the in its analogous <laughs> way, he was denied un, unemployment benefits because he had been discharged for work-related misconduct. And what was that work-related misconduct? In, in using peyote. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, Layton, let me call on you for a minute. Is this case, to use Ryan's words, just like Sherbert? So that's what he said. I'm just asking, is that right? Uh, Why no? Is there a difference between worshiping on Saturdays and using peyote? Um, in this context, I think so. Because the use of peyote is different than just how. Day. How is it different for Smith and Miss Sherbert? They're just for, that's what the religious says you got to do. Don't they say it's like um, it's like their sacrament, their highest. Yeah, I think worshiping on a certain day using peyote, those are high those are high religious orders. Why are they different? Are you gonna go back to Julianne's question? Are you really gonna tell a Native American that your religious belief is less important than Miss Sherbert going to church on Saturday? Is that is that what we're gonna do here? Thanks to Julian's getting mad. I was gonna say to be honest, the peyote is more important than Oh, you're gonna tell Miss Sherbert that her religion going to church on Saturday is less important than using peyote? Is that what you're gonna say? This is why we can't rank religions. I, I don't want to, I, right, Julian? There's a point. You, I said we can't. You, you can, right? But it, it's it's almost impossible to say what's more or less central to a religion, right? This actually comes up in the opinion. He mentions this briefly. I, I, it's excerpted, but Scalia says we don't want to be in the business of deciding what is more central. Oh well, going to church on Saturday that's important, but using peyote that's really important. How the heck can we do that? 
I don't know. I barely know it's important to my own religion, right? I, it, it, people have very different um, conceptions of their own faith and what they think is more or less important. Going to church every Sunday, taking communion, right? What, which sacrament's more important? Honoring the mother and their father, right? I mean, what, which, which sacrament we're gonna, we're gonna put at the top of the hierarchy? So let's assume that we're not gonna rank it. My question is actually a little bit different. Jonathan, why does Miss, Miss Sherbert get her exception because her Sabbath is on Saturday, but Mr. Smith does not get his exception because he was smoking or ingesting peyote? I think it goes back to uh, Reynolds in terms of regulating conduct. But isn't going to church conduct? Yeah, but I think it has more to do with the with the restrictions it imposes in that case. Look, Miss Sherbert could believe that her Sabbath is on Saturday, and Mr. Smith can believe that ingesting peyote is great. Just she won't go to church, and he won't eat the peyote. I don't see the difference. Why are they different? Anna, why are they different? Why did Smith win? And why did Sherbert win and Smith lose? I would say because um, Smith is a criminal law. Why would that matter? Why would a civil unemployment program be different than a criminal drug law? Well, I guess the drug law is in place to like help or like make sure society's not using drugs. And Same for the employment law. It's prevent fraud. What's the problem? Um, I guess, I guess it is unfair, but I think the government just is kind of claiming that they have a better in, or bigger interest. Uh, do you, what's the difference between the unemployment law and the, 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 I mean, they're both unemployment laws, to be clear, right? What's the difference between the law at issue in Smith and the law at issue in Sherbert? Well, the difference is that I want to say when someone's under like a physical approach. No, I think you're on the right track. Say it. Oh, uh, well, the law is neutral. I generally think it will look into that. I'm sorry. Religion was the object. Is what's really it was focused on. But was religion the object in South Carolina? No, but it was also, this one was also generally applicable because it applied to everyone. And Scalia voiced the concern that. But how is it different than the South Carolina law? You're on the right track, but that's not the answer. How the South Carolina law was neutral, right? Did anyone say the law was passed to target Sabbatarians? No. This one was the kind that they, I don't want to say that they weren't really sure about an exception for, but like that it would be, that it was, it's not that they kind of weren't really sure about an exception for it, but this law was, it wasn't targeting them and it wasn't meant to like hinder the faith and i think there wasn't anything else that they could block they weren't he wasn't saying that you had to do any type of scrutiny it just wasn't neutral generally all right cody what does it mean for law to be neutral law of general applicability what does that mean i think audi uses word let's just define it or is that it can be <clears throat> I mean, applied to the general public on a non discriminatory way. Okay, so was the South Carolina employment law neutral? Was it generally applicable? Okay. Was the Oregon employment law neutral? That's for Smith. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. And is it generally applicable? Yeah. So, how are they different? Just because it's criminal and civil, and like but that's what Anna said. But why does that matter? Because and I guess it goes back to the morals. I know fraud is moralistic too, but this is like an enumerated moral issue. That's okay. Let me try it differently. What's the underlying conduct that deprived Miss Sherbert of the benefits? What What did she do that deprived her of the benefits? Is that a crime itself? Okay, what is underlying conduct that deprived Mr. Smith of the benefits? Okay, everyone see that. So that doesn't answer my question, but that's a starting point, right? The underlying conduct that Miss Smith engaged in was not illegal, 
didn't violate any law. She was doing something that's perfectly legal. She was going to church on Saturday. The underlying conduct that Mr. Smith did was illegal. Okay. The marijuana, I'm sorry, the peyote law. All right. So let's try it differently. Dylan, was the controlled substance law a neutral and generally applicable law? Yes. Does it target any particular religion? Not on its face. Or in effect, does it target religion? Yes. How? Because that's a, a form of a form of action in their religion, like is peyote. Like that's how. That's the belief they have. That and what about the bigamy law in Utah? Did that target religion? Yes. Was it neutral law? No. <laughs> I mean, it's not neutral. So we have these three cases, right, that seem completely out of whack. We got Reynolds. We got Sherbert. And we got Smith. And Justice Brennan doesn't even mention Reynolds, does he? It's like Brennan isn't here, but old stuff just doesn't matter, right? Scalia says, we got Reynolds. But then he gets to Smith. I'm sorry, then he gets to Sherbert. And let's just say this one was Scalia's more awkward opinions. If Scalia had the votes to rule Sherbert, he would have. He denied the votes. It's a five to four case. So instead, he's like, we're going to limit Sherbert to its facts. And what are those facts? When you have an unemployment scheme, right? When you have an unemployment scheme that requires an individualized assessment, right? You're going to apply strict scrutiny. In other words, when you're already in analyzing each person one at a time and deciding whether or not to grant them those benefits, there's a lot of risk for religious bias and the like. <clears throat> Whereas here, we have a bright, a, bright, bright, a bright line rule. Using peyote is a crime. We're therefore, we're going to apply a rational basis standard. I know that makes absolutely no sense. <clears throat> Again, usually Scalia is crystal clear. right? When Scalia wants to be clear, he's damn clear. But here, he was not doing that. He was doing something else. Right? He was, he was cobbling together five votes for majority opinion. All right. Let's walk through this case a little bit one at a time. All right. So the first thing the court does is he reaffirms Reynolds. Beliefs are protected. Conduct is not. Mr. Smith can believe that peyote is an important sacrament, but he can't use it. Man, that's pretty shallow, right? Tell someone, yeah, you can believe where the hell you want, you just can't do it. But then we go back to human sacrifice, and it's like, oh, well, maybe that's right. To this day, the courts never clearly address this belief conduct line. I think it makes the justices very uncomfortable. Because they say, okay, well, Marijuana is fine. Going to church on Saturday is fine, but but no, no human sacrifice. What if, what if third parties being injured? Right? Maybe that's lying. Someone's being injured. We can't have it. Well, when you keep your kids home from school, does that injure them? Adi. Do you think if they defined religion, it would just? Oh God, you're gonna make me do this, aren't you? <laughs> Adi, what's religion? My opinion. I wasn't gonna do this, but you asked me, so I'm gonna do it. <laughs> what is religion? <laughs> I said, oh God, yeah. The founders were intending to recognize maybe a limited group of religions, but not the whole religion that they have that is the first amendment. Julianne, what's religion? <laughs> All right, go, 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 give me your comment. Are you talking about Scientology? <laughs> this is a very it's actually a really hard question most religions do get tax exempt stats it's actually very hard to not get it yeah then like i 
Oh, about yeah, but the yeah. the colanders in their head, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that's her thing. Um, right. So let me go back to Adi's question a minute ago. Thank you for your for your comment. Um, what is religion? The court does not want to touch this question with a ten foot spaghetti pole, right? <laughs> Because it gets to a really hard space of we're calling you a, a liar or questioning your own beliefs. This is why they don't want to do sincerity either. right? Once you start probing sincerity, say, like, oh, that's not really a religion. We're, we're in a very gray space. So I've done this because that's what I do. But you know, a lot of the Satanist people, I think it's not a religion. I think it's a mockery. Right? They're, 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 if you read their literature, they, they are on the web saying, we are not a real church. We're doing this to just make fun of religion. Right, they're pretty open about it. I think at least those groups are there, but there are other statements saying, "Yep, we believe in Satan; he's our deity, and uh, we, we 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 believe in this." So the, the the related questions of is this actually religion, and is this actually sincere? Right, is this like the Church of Marijuana? Right, is this really a religion? Is it sincere? These two questions sort of loop together because if it's not a real religion, it can't be sincere, and if you're not sincere, it's probably not a real religion. So these two questions reinforce. The courts do not want to touch us. I've gotten in so much trouble for even writing about these issues. Very angry at me. But I think it's, if you want to take religious liberty seriously, not everyone will get it because it's not really religion. In other words, if, if everyone gets this full robust protection of rights on balance, it narrows how broad the rights can, I said again, if anyone can claim religious liberty rights, that makes it less likely those rights to be robust because we can't give everyone all these rights. Versus if they're using a more narrowly circumscribed area, maybe they're more robust. People don't like when I say that, but it's, I think it's true. All right, but let's go back to Sherbert, right? At least here the court says we're going to stick to the line of beliefs versus practice, right? Exercise is what's up here. Once it leaves your head, the government can perhaps prohibit it. That's a very scary thought. And uh, the dissent is not in your book. But the dissent uses the example sort of sacramental wine, right? You can believe in it, but just you can't drink it, right? So it's all, it's, it's all up here. It's kind of like, you know, COVID religion, right? You can go on Zoom, but you can't actually, you know, <laughs> engage in it. What, what is the value in protecting the belief that you can't actually act on it? Well, it goes back to Madison, right? It's between a person and their higher power, but every religious belief that I know of has a physical component. In other words, you're not just reading stuff in the abstract, you know, because it's fun. It's something you have to live the doctrine, right? Which is why the Reynolds line is, is very unsatisfying. Because if you take it seriously, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, by City Hall, by the library there, there are people there who hand out food to the homeless. And the government's trying to shut them down for years. And they say, Julian, you know this one? And they've said, this is our religious belief. Our religious belief is charity. And the way that we manifest our, our faith is by giving poor, uh, giving food to the poor. Um, and the government says, that's fine, go feed them somewhere else. But the, the, the more fundamental issue is even an act of giving charity is a way of manifesting your religious beliefs. But then we're giving people you know, a carve out to, to you know, vagrancy laws of what they can do. You know, on yeah, this has been being litigated for as long as I can remember. Uh, also, you know, people who hand out food to the homeless people at the, uh, you know, by the freeway entrance, right, at a red light. Uh, they, they, they've been ticketed for that. They've actually been challenging religious liberty grounds as well. We have, a, we have a RIFRA in Texas that provides more protection. Uh, but very often, beliefs go beyond it. So in other words, Scalia here is, again, he was a devout Catholic with like nine grandchildren, right? He believed what he, he practiced what he preached, okay? Let me just put it that way. Um, but he's saying that Protection of religion falls to the political process. It's not something that the courts can create carve-outs for. It's almost the exact opposite of what you see the conservatives in the court argue today. It's just remarkable how the Smith issue is just flipped. If you look at Smith, there's all the conservatives in the majority and the liberals in their dissent. And in 25 years, it flipped the entire exact opposite way around. Why? I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Society changed. Perhaps we had a more religious society that enforced morality, Smith looks pretty good. But when you have a less less religious, amoral society, not amoral society, an amoral society, 
Smith starts looking pretty bad because you have governments start doing things that religions don't like, like contraceptive mandates and the like, and sort of flips the dynamics. All right. Yeah. Is there an alternative way to read his opinion? I mean, something kind of different because I I heard that, but I completely forgot what the person was telling me that like the alternative way to read Scalia was that like wouldn't require an overruling of Smith. Um, is it the least the uh, most favored nation, most favored rights? Uh, get back to that one later. <laughs> okay. All right. Um. Let's go on. Uh, what Scalia basically does, he, and, and Anna said this, so it was being difficult to her, I'm sorry, but he basically says that, well, this is criminal, it's different. That's not really a distinction. It's a distinction without a difference, but he drew a distinction. And he says, we can't apply this compelling governmental interest test here. If we apply the <clears throat> compelling interest test here, it creates a right to ignore laws. He also says we shouldn't really be deciding what's central to a person's faith. He writes, we are courting anarchy, great line, courting anarchy. As our society becomes more religiously diverse, every religion becomes a law unto itself. I will not do this. So we will let the political process decide how this works. So what's the upshot? If a law is neutral and generally applicable, you give it rational basis review. Even if a law burns religion, if it's neutral and generally applicable, it's given a rational basis review. It's up to the political process to grant exceptions, not for the courts. And again, this was a conservative decision with all the court's conservatives there. All right, to Scalia's dying day, he never went back on Smith. He went back on some stuff he did, but, but, but never Smith. We'll do Fulton next week. Fulton was an attempt over Earl Smith. Didn't work. And I don't think the court's going to. They don't have to now. I'll explain why next week. All right. Questions on Smith? If you want to get people angry, say, what do you think of Smith? All right, that, that's a good question to get people angry. Ryan? So, is this still, I mean, is this still a good law? No. Ish. So that you can't... Ish. Ask me after we do Fulton next week if, if Smith is still good law. I think the court has, and this is Josh speaking, that's what the court has said. Um, I think the court has sort of retreated from Smith a little bit in a couple important ways, but we'll talk about that next week. Exactly. In other words, let me put, I'll just give you a preview. I think the court has shifted what it means to be neutral and generally applicable. We'll get into this a little bit more with Lukumi, but I think courts are shifted how it approaches neutrality, which is in an important way. I just think it's, I just experienced this a long time ago when I was in the military where this is actually a carve out in the Department of Defense that you, if you're a Native American, you can, you know, actually, because I mean, obviously, drug use is totally prohibited in the military, but you can't, there's a carve out for Native use. Oh, indeed. After the Smith decision, Congress basically enacted laws creating exceptions for certain Native peoples. To use different hallucinogens. There was another case involving the, um, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, ayahuasca. And it's it's this key uh, from Brazil, I think. Uh, it, was, it was a case called uh, Gonzalez versus Ocentro, and involved whether this other uh, Indian tribe was able to use this um, hallucinogenic tea, and they were allowed to. Okay. All right. The the O'Connor, it's a concurrence in judgment, basically, in this sense. It's not in your book. But she's like, Scalia overruled sure without saying so. She was very, very, very angry at Scalia. And she would continue imposing strict scrutiny or something close to it uh, uh, for these laws. And Justice Blackman dissented with Brendan and Marshall. Um, and they would basically reaffirm Sherbert. All right. What happened after Smith is kind of remarkable. Okay. In 1993, Congress enacts RIFRA. RFRA, the Religious Freedom, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Okay, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This was a bipartisan bill that was 
extremely popular. Uh, just to give you a sense, it was introduced in the House by Chuck Schumer, the current Democratic Majority Leader. Right? Religious liberty was very different in the early 90s. Not everyone favored RIFRA, but it was very popular. And what this law did, um, simplifying more or less, was to restore the Sherbert test. It was to restore, bring back the Sherbert test. So that if any state or federal government imposed a substantial burden on religion, they'd have to satisfy strict scrutiny. Now, did you all study in Kamala, City of Bernie against Flores? Sound familiar? This was a probably one of the most important decisions of the Supreme Court in American history. Uh, it doesn't get enough importance. Um, what happened was you had a church in San Antonio. Um, uh, it's near San Antonio, Bernie, Florida, uh, City of Bernie. And the church wanted to expand because that's so many people. Good problem to have, right? But, this, but the government denied a permit to build because it was a very beautiful historical site. And said, sorry, we care more about what your church looks like than how people fit in there. Too bad. Don't get your permit. The church brought suit, as actually Archbishop Flores brought suit under the RIFRA. He sued the city of Texas, which, as you know, has sovereign immunity. Generally, you can't sue a state without its permission. But RIFRA said, yes, go right to federal court based on the statute. So again, Smith said, if a law is neutral, you give it rational basis review. RIFRA said, no, no, a neutral law gets strict scrutiny that burns religion. What did the Supreme Court say? RIFRA was unconstitutional as applied to the states. Why? The Supreme Court gets to decide what the Constitution means, not Congress. And Congress's powers under Section 5 are limited to enforcing the decisions of the Supreme Court. Right? Congress cannot give more rights than what the Supreme Court said. Again, this is probably one of those important decisions of the 20th century, maybe full time. Uh, I go back and forth on RIFRA. I think it's probably wrong, but uh, the, the brain decision, but I, I get it. Um, as a result, RIFRA was unconstitutional as applied to state government. So it remains on the books for federal. So if the federal government burns your religion out of the neutral law, it's subject to strict scrutiny. But if New York imposes a, uh, a neutral law that burns religion, you're still applying the Smith test. So again, under federal law, Sherbert is the rule. RIFRA is the rule. Under the state laws, you're back in Smith land, which is a neutral law. Um, now, many states have enacted what are called baby RIFRAs. So Texas has a RIFRA, which mirrors the federal standards. So that's why the people handing out food by City Hall, by the library, can raise a RIFRA claim. Right? So under Texas law, if the government poses a neutral law that burns religion, you still use strict scrutiny. New York does not have a RIFRA. California doesn't have a RIFRA. Most of the big states don't have them. Okay. Questions on RIFRA? Again, it's not really a common law. It's a statutory issue, but it did become a big issue with Bernie Flores. What was I think it's probably wrong. I mean, it depends how much of a supremacist I'm feeling that's judicial, not you know, otherwise, right? I, I think it's probably wrong because I don't think the Supreme Court has a monopoly in the Constitution. Uh, I, I think Congress had the primary driver of deciding what the 14th Amendment means. Uh, the challenge is there's a lot of precedent saying otherwise. I think that Bernie probably followed from a line of precedent saying the court just has, has its power. So. I, I would probably have to uproot a lot of doctrine to get there. But look, Scalia joined the majority in Bernie. Right? Again, even, even Scalia makes mistakes sometimes, I suppose. Um, but I think, was Bernie, I think Bernie was 7-2? Uh, what was the vote on Supreme Flores? I should have looked up beforehand. It was 7-2. O'Connor, a oh, 6-3, right. So O'Connor, Souter, and Breyer were in dissent. Uh, but Ginsburg joined the majority, as did Stevens. Yeah, this wasn't, this wasn't, you know, you know, six three across the board. So it it wasn't strictly ideological. Did the dissent say did they agree with your position that the Supreme Court isn't the final arbiter on constitutionality or no? No, I think I think they all agreed on this point. I think that they um oh god, I don't remember. 
What did the dissent say? I think O'Connor sort of, uh, I don't remember. I haven't thought this case in a couple of years. I don't, I don't, I don't sign the dissent either. Uh, I'll look up later. I'll get back to you. I don't remember. Uh, I know O'Connor complained because she said that Smith was wrong. And I can't remember if her dissent was based on, I think it was only based on the Smith being wrong. Oh. I, I, I might be wrong on that though. I'm not sure. I'll look up later. I'm not sure. All right. Everyone okay with, with uh, Rifra and Bernie? Other than the question I couldn't answer. All right, let's do City of Hialeah, um, Florida. Uh, uh, Churchill Lukumi. All right, who's next? Lane, are you next? No. Who's next? Sure. sure. <laughs> Give me the facts in Churchill Lukumi. I, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, you know, the guy in the military never raise your hand for anything, right? Because <laughs> you might get cold. Huh? All right, go ahead. Um, there's a church that practices Santeria. Okay. Um, moving into the city, and the city in response passed a bunch of laws outlawing um, animal cruelty and subjecting criminal punishment anyone who unnecessarily kills any animal. All right. Let's just just sort of unpack the facts a little bit here. Um, the city council governments usually move with such speed? I have no idea. I guess not. Shania? I would say definitely. No. How do usually govern, local governments usually move? Very slow. How do they move in this case, my friend? They move with lightning speed. Lightning speed, yeah. Why do you think they move with lightning speed here? They really do not want this church that has chickens in their neighborhood. Okay, fair point. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, the the sort of the chronology, the sequence of events here, I think, is very striking, and it actually did play an important role in Justice Kennedy's uh, majority decision, right? So we have this faith called the Santeria, and it's this basically it's a I'll make sure I do this for a sec. It, it's what's called, called syncretism, where you have elements of Catholicism and elements of African religions that sort of kind of come together, and one of their sacraments is animal sacrifice. Uh, you know, you might say, oh, that's gross. Look, bigamy, using peyote, animal sacrifices. The reason why these cases go to the courts is because they're sort of weird. And I don't want to say this is pejorative. If these are things are viewed as normal by majority society, they'd be allowed. The reason why is you go to courts that they're not allowed. A lot of religious rituals kind of look weird. People sing weird songs. They speak in tongues. They use animals in rituals. There are different things that people do that might just look different from what you're used to. But in a pluralistic society, we recognize that there are different ways people express their faith. So this church acquired some land in Florida. Highly is kind of your Fort Lauderdale. It's kind of in the South Florida area. And the city says, oh, no, we need to enact these emergency ordinances. Again, this is local government. They usually don't move this lightning speed, right? But they move fast here. Uh, one resolution said they have concern about certain religious practices. I wonder which ones, right? That might be consistent with public morals, right? Another emergency resolution says uh, you cannot un un kill an animal in a cruel fashion. Uh, another emergency ordinance uh, uh, basically bars sacrificing. You can still kill animals when you're hunting, right? You do the other stuff. You just you can't kill the animals as part of this sacrifice. Uh, another one uh, said you can't slaughter animals unless you have a slaughterhouse. That's fine. You can't slaughter animals in this religious. I mean, they were basically carving out a ring around this church, right? That made everything this church should be illegal, but any other type of animal slaughter was 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 a okay. So the first question to ask ourselves here, Eric, was this law? Neutral? Why was it not neutral? Um, I think, well, uh, the resolution itself, um, just as a start, kind of illustrated the point that although facially we didn't specifically target the, the faith, mm -hmm. um, there was obviously a concern of a non specific uh, 
certain religion that performed animal sacrifices. Um, um, and then also all the cutouts too. Um, so they kind of had a, a kosher exception. Oh, there was an exception for kosher? There was, yeah. Kosher exception, obviously slaughterhouse exception. Yeah. But but I, I want to go back to neutrality. Eric, what does it mean for a lot to be neutral? <laughs> what does it mean for a lot to be neutral? I don't want to do more generally. Now, look, I, you want to. They're, they're different kind of. We'll get to general applicable in a couple minutes. I would say, um, I would guess not detrimenting one group more than the other. Jamar, take a stab. What does neutral mean in this context? Not singling the particular group. Singling out. What do we call in the protection context a law that singles out one group? What's that word we use? Protected class. Eh, it's with an A. Alienation? Eh, no. Aaron? No? Anyone know what I'm looking for? What word am I looking for? It's with an A. Can you get a second letter? N. I. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> You're very animated today. Yes, Anna's. I'll give you another hint. Yes, animus. <laughs> Animated like that, right? Animus, right? Animus. This is Justice Kennedy's favorite thing in the world. In every case, there's animus. He said it in Romer, in Windsor, in Lawrence, and in Bergevin. My goodness. In Masteries, if Justice Kennedy thought you had animus, you lost. That's it. If you could just write in a brief, Justice Kennedy, there's animus, you'd win the case. That's all you had to do back in the day. Um, animus. This law drips with animus. It is so blatantly obvious that they were targeting the Santeria faith. I mean, they can't really argue otherwise, right? You can't say law is neutral when you're targeting a group with animus. And when I say animus, I don't, I mean kind of hatred. They did not like these people. They did not like their, their weird beliefs. They want to get rid of them. You cannot have this sort of animus. So the law is not neutral, and that's targeting. And this is the phrase we use, it's targeting. The law target is, targets one religion, it's not neutral. So I want to go back to the first case. Was Reynolds neutral? Ugh. I mean, in one sense, yes, because no one can engage in bigamy. In the other sense, the only people who were engaging in bigamy were Mormons. So again, a lot of these cases don't line up neatly. Right? Was Texas limiting marriage to a man and a woman neutral? Oh, yeah, it's neutral law. It applies to everyone equally. But the court said in Windsor, or I'm sorry, in Obergefell, it's targeting gay people because of their, of their sexual uh, 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 practices. So, again, these cases aren't all on all fours. They, they sort of don't line up. But this is a case where they use the word sacrifice in the ordinance. They use ritual in the ordinance. They had in mind one religion, the Santeria. And when you target one religion, it's not neutral. Okay, so we get neutrality. Neutrality is the easier one. The harder one is the second one, Aaron. Generally applicable. You're welcome. What does it mean for law to be generally applicable? Only the Supreme Court justices know. No, 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 no. There's stuff here. We can do it. You too can be a Supreme Court justice for the day. You're welcome. What does it mean to be generally applicable? Not like a general public purpose. I think you say a general application. Try, try to define it without the words. What does it mean to be generally applicable? Why is okay? okay uh, <laughs> uh, uniform. Oh, okay. Good. What does that mean, uniform? Or how do you know this law is not generally applicable? Let me ask a question that way. What about this law makes it not generally applicable?
there's a group of people in the community who are practicing animal sacrifice and the it pretty much only applies to them. Okay, let's try differently. Who does law not apply to? Not practicing animal sacrifice. Okay, Julian, let me let me try this a little bit differently. Um, <clears throat> if what is the pro what is the problem the government's trying to achieve here? What, they don't come out and say we want to just we hate Santeria people, right? What what's the sort of the rationale they give in court? Why they have this law? They say that they're trying to protect the public health. Okay, it, specifically, what aspect of public health? Um, I believe one of the things they mentioned is making sure that people don't eat or digest meat that isn't regulated. Okay. So if their concern is about people eating meat that's not prepared in a, in a clean fashion, what would we expect the government to actually do? Yeah. Inspections, right? Refrigeration requirements, right? Are there other laws that you would expect the government to enact if there were people eating unpure food foods? All right, Ryan, what about the issue of, you know, after you kill an animal, what do you do with the remains? You just put it in the garbage can, toss it on the curb. I mean, they don't. Uh, they don't. They're not regulating the disposal of animal properties. Yeah. Or any for hunters or food processing. Yeah, you can just throw it in the garbage can, right? Yeah. Lane, more question. Are they concerned about how the animals are slaughtered if they're slaughtered in a, perhaps an, uh, an inhumane fashion? Is that something they're really worried about here? So if I'm a hunter and I can just, you know, go, you know, wild and start slaughtering animals, can I do that? So here's how it works. A law that's generally applicable has a clear relationship between the means and the ends, right? Here's what we want to accomplish and here's what we're going to do it. And it makes sense, right? If they're worried about inhumane slaughter, it will apply across the board. If they're worried about people eating food that's not properly prepared, they'll have inspection laws. If they're worried about, um, you know, uh, disposal, they'll have laws saying, here's how you dispose of animal remains. There's a special trash pickup up once a week for it. You have to pay an extra fee for it. But they've done none of that. We say the law is under-inclusive. And we did this in Brown and EMA, <laughs> under-inclusive. There's a very common Kennedy technique for scrutiny. If what you're doing is trying to keep people safe, what you're doing is actually a lot less than this, right? Right? This is this is so under-inclusive. You're talking on such a small part of the problem, right? It's selective. You're targeting only a very small part of the problem, which suggests this is not really a big problem. You've never worried about this issue before until this church moved to town. It's proof that you're not really worried about this church. I'm sorry, you're not really worried about animal safety, you worry about this church in particular. Because this is under selective, under inclusive, you have what's here a law that's not generally applicable. And because the law is not generally applicable, we are not under the test from Smith. Right? What test do we apply? Sherbert. Again, when law is not neutral and not generally applicable, we go back to the Sherbert test, and we review this with strict scrutiny. Does the government have a compelling interest to protect animal safety? Sure they do. But is this the least restrictive means of getting there? No, it is not. And as a result, this law flunks strict scrutiny. Okay. Questions. So what you have to do is you have to read Smith and Lakumi as back to back. Right? What Smith says if a law is neutral 
and generally applicable. We apply a rational basis standard. If a law is not neutral and not generally applicable, we apply the Sherbert test and strict scrutiny. All right. And by the way, like, I just actually checked Adi. The, the dissent in Bernie Woods about Smith being wrong. So that's all they cared about. I just Googled it while I was talking. I can do that. <laughs> I can multitask. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, th I, th I thought it was O'Connor dissented saying that Smith was wrong. I think Souter dissent along similar lines and Breyer to similar dissent. All right. So again, here are we are, right? Let me just sort of lay this out again, just clearly, right? Okay. With RIFRA, you apply the Sherbert test for federal laws. Okay. But for state laws, you apply Smith if neutral and generally applicable. And Lukumi, if not neutral and generally applicable. Now, someone's going to ask me, what if it's neutral but not generally applicable? Or what if it's generally applicable but not neutral? They're one and the same. It's going to be very hard to check one of these boxes. Usually they're both checked at the same time. If something's not neutral, it's not going to be generally applicable. And if it's not generally applicable, it's probably not neutral. So it's going to be a rare case where it's one, not the other. But the either one will trigger Lukumi. Okay? I don't have written yet. I don't. I, I, I'll be completely honest. It's hard to think what such a law would be. If you can think of one, please tell me. Um, but but what we saw during the you know we'll do Fulton next week. Maybe ask me next week after we do Fulton. Because at issue with a lot of the COVID cases, I'll sort of maybe give you a preview. With the COVID cases, is well, uh, we impose limitations on churches, but not casinos. Is that neutral and generally applicable? Right? Are you treating like as like? Is it targeting religion? And so on. I don't want to give the game away, but these were huge issues during the COVID cases. I, such bad law was made during COVID. Everything was bad about that, but you, a, lot, a lot of really bad law was still sort of picking up the pieces from. It's sort of crazy we went through this. I, last, last month, our first month was during COVID and was still teaching stuff in real time. Yeah. For the purposes of studying, are you going to be time stamped like? Period. Really good question. Well, RIFRA is a statute enacted in 1993, so it's on the books. Um, if you ask Justice Scalia, it's not here anymore, he'd say that Smith is consistent with Sherbert. So uh, uh, Smith came out and it was 1990. That's the rule from 1990 on. And, and Alakumi was 1993, I go by a year or so. That, those are our rules now. And we'll do Fulton next week, which is a little bit different. Fulton was 2020 or 21. All right. Questions. All right. Let me let me wrap up, and you can uh, you can get out of here. Um, when we're talking about religion, right? We ask ourselves, is there actually a burden? Right. It's almost similar to the free speech issues, right? Is there actually a burden on religion? And we generally presume yes, but it's not always so clear. What was the burden in Sherbert? We ask also, is the belief sincere? The question Julianne hated, but it's in the law. It's in the cases. We ask, what's the state's interest? And usually the state has an important interest, but usually got to be either compelling or not so compelling, depending on the scrutiny. But really what matters under the current doctrine is, is this law targeting religion or is it neutral? And that almost dictates the entire outcome of the case. In the COVID decisions, what was so adamant was that we are not targeting religion. In fact, there was evidence they were, but, but that, that didn't always come out. My favorite is, oh, you can just worship on Zoom, uh, which is very hollow for people to use electricity on the Sabbath because you can't. Anyway, what do we know? Questions? All right, have a lovely evening, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.